Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Captain's Lifestyle Podcast. I am joined by two experts in the red light field today, Andrew Latour and Phil Welch. Andrew Latour is the founder of Gemba Red. He is a pioneer in the realm of the red light therapy industry, a field that has been revolutionizing health and wellness for countless individuals worldwide. With Gemba Red, Andrew has created a brand that stands at the forefront of technological advancement and holistic health, blending cutting-edge science with an unwavering commitment to quality and efficacy. Andrew's journey is nothing short of inspirational. His dedication to rigorous research, coupled with a profound understanding of the benefits of red light therapy, has set new standards in the industry. Through Gembered, Andrew has brought to market a range of products that are not only innovative, but also accessible and affordable, empowering people to take control of their health in ways previously unimaginable. But it's not just his professional achievements that make Andrew a standout figure. His passion for educating others, his integrity in his business practices, and his genuine desire to improve lives are qualities that resonate deeply with all who cross his path. Andrew's work has not only earned him a loyal following, but also the respect and admiration of his peers in the health and wellness community. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of photobiomodulation. Big word there, but don't worry, we'll break it down. Delving into the science behind red light therapy and the future of this exciting field. Also joining us today is my good friend, Phil Welch, a revolutionary thinker in the world of red light therapy and creator of the Less Is More Red Light Protocol. With his protocol, Phil has ushered in a new era of simplicity and efficacy, demonstrating that sometimes the most profound solutions are found in the most straightforward approaches. His protocol has become a beacon of hope and healing for countless individuals seeking to enhance their well-being with minimalistic yet highly effective methods. Phil's journey to creating the Less is More Red Light Protocol is a testament to his relentless pursuit of knowledge and his deep-seated passion for health. Drawing on years of meticulous research and a profound understanding of the therapeutic potential of red light, Phil has crafted a a protocol that is both accessible and remarkably powerful. His work embodies the philosophy that true wellness can and will be achieved without unnecessary complexity, making advanced red light therapy attainable for everyone. What sets Phil Welch apart is not only his innovative mind, but also his unwavering commitment to education and empowerment. He has dedicated himself to sharing his knowledge helping others understand and harness the benefits of red light therapy. Through his efforts, Phil has built a community of health conscious individuals who are united by their trust in his expertise and their shared journey toward better health. Andrew and Phil, welcome to the Captain's Lifestyle <laughs> Podcast. Thanks. Wow, Thanks man. Thank you. Yeah. So Andrew and I, we recorded one, what that, I think that was two years ago now. Yeah, it has to be two years. I was trying to remember. I was like, was it last year? But I think it was two years now. And yeah. the title of that one was Everything You Need to Know About Red Light Therapy. However, there have been some new findings, and especially with Phil's red light protocol and the, the new panels that you're coming out with, we've got a lot more to cover. So I want to start off with the basics. I said a big, big word in the introduction, photobiomodulation. So Andrew, can you start off with just a general overview of what is photobiomodulation and red light therapy? Yeah, yeah. You know, most people know it as as red light therapy is kind of the term we use kind of to the uh, average person, to the, the consumer. Um, but the science is, is kind of named this photobiomodulation. And it's actually a relatively recent term that was decided about 10 years ago into the medical literature. So now you can search and all the articles on, you know, this, this kind of red light therapy, this kind of light therapy is under this index of, of photobiomodulation to help kind of consolidate all the research that's been going on. Um, so really it's, you know, you can break it down. Photo we know has to do with light, uh, bio 
has to do with biologies and cells and things like that. And modulation, we're trying to affect some sort of change in the cells, you know, and sometimes it can be a, a stimulatory reaction and sometimes it's an inhibitory reaction or you can create, you know, different types of modulation. So kind of the predecessor was kind of called um, low-level light therapy or low-level laser therapy, which was the acronym LLLT. And, um, you know, that was that was a good term. So most a lot of the older studies are, are indexed under that. Um, but now it's kind of redefined as this photobiomodulation. So, yeah, it's a nice fancy word that kind of encapsulates this this new kind of era of science. And it can use, you know, any wavelength of, of kind of so-called light um, of the sunlight spectrum, specifically anything from UV, blue, green, red, near infrared, you know, far infrareds, whatnot. Um, so it's within that sunlight spectrum. So I'll, a lot of it we might call light, but might be invisible, like near infrareds and UVs are invisible light. So they don't have any brightness. They don't have any color. Um, but most of the science is around this red and near infrared range because the red and near infrared just happens to have some of the best effects, some of the best safety profiles, some of the best um, penetration into the skin. And so, you know, a lot of times we kind of want it to be synonymous with red and near infrared. So most of the studies will say photobiomodulation studies this range, but that's not always the case. And the other caveat in the definition is uh, LLLT and photobiomodulation. They specifically use low intensities that don't cause a lot of heat because especially when you get heat involved, you can have other safety you know issues. You can burn yourself or something, or you know heat just starts to initiate different mechanisms that we just want to know the effects of light on the the cells in the biology and not so much heat so they wanted to differentiate these two kind of fields because you can use light and you know infrareds and whatnot for heat therapy but we, we're trying to use light for this what's the actual direct cellular effects that light has on on cells and skin and, and different types of tissue next question is going to be a, a big broad question that we don't have to go into depth on but the benefits of red light therapy. So I know this is something that a lot of people are curious about, especially if they've they've never heard of it or they've maybe heard of it from a friend or somebody, but like what are the main benefits of red light therapy? Because I I describe it often as a, a panacea, kind of like a coconut oil, like good for everything, yeah. basically, right. because it's essentially taking wavelengths of natural light of the sun and just concentrating it and, and putting it into a a concentrated device. So, so what are the main benefits of red and infrared light therapy? Um, yeah, yes. I'll, 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 I'll speak go, first go real it. quick and say, yeah. you know, my misconception of red light before I really um, got some of these panels was that it was like a replacement for sunlight. And if I get a lot of sunlight, why do I need to red light? And I think that applies for full body red light at a distance, but I do think it's different when you apply it directly on the skin and you get deeper penetration than you would from sunlight. So there are things that I've healed or things I've noticed that I wouldn't get from sunlight um, and just taking the narrow spectrums and applying them. So that's what I'll just throw out there. As you said, like some people kind of view it as like, oh, it's summertime. Why do I need um, red light? And there are applications, uh, full body red light. I don't really use in the in the summer, in the winter, I do. Um, but yeah, we could continue on with, you know, it's it's a panacea or whatever you said, because it's um, affecting the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are kind of the center of health and wellness. That's, you know, that's what kind of got me to red light is just this focus on the mitochondria. I'll let Andrew go, um, whatever he wants to say next. No, yeah, yeah you're Andrew. right. You know, with, with sunlight, you know, the lack of sunlight with modern lifestyles that does, you know, correlate to a lot of the modern diseases. So if we can intervene with basically any kind of light therapy, that's usually a good thing to get us back on track in terms of health. Uh, and like you said, it's it's kind of this panacea, you know, it can sound like a snake oil if you start listening out the benefits without any context, um, mm -hmm. because it's so foundational because it affects the mitochondria. The mitochondria produce the ATP, the energy currency of the cell. And, you know, with a lot of the biohacking and a lot of the health, health focus stuff we do is based on mitochondrial support because we know 
you know, our diseases aren't coded into our DNA. It has to do with more epigenetic factors and, you know, how how well our, our mitochondria function. Um, so just like a really short list would be something like, you know, it can help accelerate wound healing and hair growth. That was some of the original studies with that was that they just observed faster wound healing in, in rodents and rats. And that that kind of was what started um, this whole science of low la- laser therapy. But now, you know, there's so many studies, a bunch of review articles I, I've been reading on brain health and basically all aspects of, of brain conditions and brain health. Again, I can't make any, you know, specific medical claims, but just generally they're studying things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, TBI, you know, a uh, recent one I just saw was on, you know, AD, ADHD, um, you know, so all all de- depression and whatnot. So all different manner of, of brain issues and, and pro- improving cognitive health. And that's obviously such a big problem for, for you know, the modern lifestyle, um, you know, but it also supports eye health. You know, there's some uh, viral studies that went around for supporting eye health and, and improving vision. And that's that's another big key factor. Um, it's huge in cosmetic industry, dermatology of anti-aging, anti-wrinkles, you know, having better skin complexion uh, overall. So it's huge for for skin care and all that stuff. Uh, but it's also great for improved circulation, for improved uh, workout recovery, for improved, uh, you know, kind of athletic performance, um, improved kind of injury recovery, injury repair, all, all kinds of wounds and issues. Um, so really, it's not cover... Hard to say anything it doesn't do. I was trying to do a post the other day of like, oh, one study found it didn't help people jump higher. And another study (laughs) found it doesn't help people run faster. So it's not like a Nike shoe that makes you run faster and jump higher immediately. But it is very important to add into like a training program to help with the recovery and help with the the muscle growth and all that stuff. But it it found it it didn't make you jump higher and run faster. A couple other things that weren't mentioned actual health yep. and, and reproduction yep. for both guys and girls. This is one of my hacks, a little bit of red light on the uh, perineum and, and balls before sexual activity just gets it, uh, gets it nice and, and uh, rock solid, ready to go. And there's, a, there's actually limited research on like increasing testosterone or I, I think you don't even have to treat your balls directly. I think if you treat anywhere on the body, you'll get some of that effect of increased nitric oxide, which is part of the effect of why it's working is it's liberating nitric oxide from cytochrome C oxidase, which kind of speeds up. Um, it kicks back on the ATPase production and that liberation of nitric oxide could probably contribute down there and doesn't matter where you treat, but treating there might have be harder to study and doing longer term treatments there might actually help the cells long term. Mm-hmm. But I, I just throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's there's some studies on sperm mobility and sperm mm-hmm. kind of health. Um, but yeah, and definitely can help with the circulation, which can help with your sexual performance. And you can try to do that. Maybe if you do it a couple hours before, because some of the, the benefits kind of peak a couple hours after you do the, the red light therapy session. And so that's that's an interesting tip is that, you know, a lot of the studies are finding kind of a delayed effects of red light therapy that, you know, the peak of benefits, the peak of ATP production come, you know, about three to six hours after a session. And so if you're really trying to hack, you know, a certain thing, uh, cognitive performance, athletic performance or sexual performance, you can t- try to time it, you know, a couple hours earlier and then then hit that window right on. Um, so that's that's always Kind of, a, you know, that's one of the kind of newer kind of facts that I, I think is very interesting is that is this kind of delayed response and this response that stays in your body and in your cells for usually, you know, up to 24 to 48 hours after a session has ended, uh, which kind of goes into some of Phil's um, pro- health protocols of, you know, more isn't better because, you know, you have this building up of the benefits and building up of the effects over time. So it's it's kind of more important. People might ask, oh, what time of day should I do it? A lot of times it's more important just to do it consistently so that way it's always in your system. Like this weekend, I strained, I strained my uh, calf muscle, you know, just running up a hill. And, I, you know, I didn't really have any lights with me. I, I sat out in some sunlight for a little while. But, you know, I healed very quickly. Like it could have been like a calf strain that lasts for weeks. And I'm already just walking around, moving around, you know, with no problem, just because you always have that 
kind of base level of, of healing factor inside your cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't need any study to tell me uh, my, my experience that, that it absolutely helps with blood flow all around, all around. I, I, and I, I do notice it like if, if I'm doing it consistently and, you know, even, you know, more in the summer and stuff is, is in the mornings, you start to notice that the light's starting to kick in when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And nitric oxide, for anybody who's unfamiliar, is uh, a vasodilator, meaning that it right. expands the blood vessels, which is one of the uh, mechanisms of action that red light contributes to. So a lot of people take supplements for nitric oxide, which can work phenomenally, but we can also get it naturally through sunlight, through red light therapy, through even just simply nasal breathing. Uh, okay. Another one of the benefits of red light therapy especially now that it's summer is it can help to heal sun related skin damage so if you do get sunburnt spending time in the morning and evening sun or supplementing with red light panels has saved me many times uh, when i'm yeah. out for multiple hours more than my solar callus has been prepped for and uh, yeah good for wrinkles scar and yeah you mentioned wound healing um, so, so yeah, basically a, a panacea and we, we haven't even gotten in depth into all of the, you know, benefits of treating the eyes and systemic benefits, which we are going to get into, but that's why I consider red light therapy to be the number one biohack that anybody invests in. I think most biohacks are significantly overrated and way overpriced for what they actually offer you. Because what is a biohack? It's essentially taking something that nature has already provided us and making it super expensive to get the benefits inside your home, right? So yeah, red light is just different wavelengths of red and infrared light, like we're getting from the sun. And uh, we can, so there's benefits of using it in the winter when there's less sun. If you live in a place like Seattle, helping with circadian rhythm, which sleep is the rising tide that raises all ships, meaning that once you get better quality sleep, everything else in your life is going to start to improve. So yeah, on that, I mean, if you listen to um, Dr. Hamlin or any of these uh, guys studying red light on the brain, their number one thing they point out is like the immediate effect is better sleep. And the reasoning behind it could be treating anywhere on the body, but a lot of those studies will be on the brain. But it's interesting to note that like that's like the, the effect that the people feel right away or see or can measure is better sleep. And the reason behind that could be a lot of things. So do you have something to say on that? Yeah, yeah no, I think, yeah, there's a lot. And especially with the sleep is, you know, a lot of people str struggle with sleep and sleep is, is a big root cause of uh, this downward spiral for a lot of health conditions. And um, you know, we we found recently, you know, some of the studies found that 95% of our melatonin is produced in our cells by our mitochondria, and only 5% is produced, you know, in the pineal gland that gets excreted at night. And, you know, again, we've got this mismatch of using too much uh, electronics and blue light at night, and we're not getting enough bright light during the day. Um, so red light therapy and near infrared light also kind of help you you know get that right melatonin production which melatonin also is a very powerful antioxidant and you know is that signaling hormone for sleep and uh you know it helps with uh you know getting your circadian rhythm on track if you're using a big full body panel or i tell people to hack all the time is just aim your panel at your face even if you have a small panel aim it at your face at your eyes you know, at the appropriate distance, so it's not too powerful. That's a huge kind of bright light therapy, kind of circadian rhythm uh, regulator to get that, you know, especially if you do it in the morning or during the day, to get that bright light during the day and help you with sleep at night. And the only way you know the intensity to do that is buying a Gemberet, really, because right, right. all the but other you panels, might yeah. you, might yeah. fry, you might fry your eyes if you don't. Yeah, and that's, that's you know going to be a big question uh, you know of your viewers if they've seen uh, you know other competitors and other brands that they're all telling people that they have to wear goggles now because they made their panels so powerful as as this kind of marketing gimmick that now they have to protect their eyes when they use it and that wasn't the case you know five or six years ago none of the brands required goggles with with the the standard uh, LED panels 
it was only, you know, relatively recently that all these panels just did it as this marketing gimmick and all these influencers are encouraging brands to keep increasing their intensities higher and higher. And there's, you're kind of losing out on benefits for your eyes and for your circadian rhythm when you have to cover your eyes. Yeah. I just saw, I just saw a Juve marketing advertisement online and they were uh, showing window wear eye protection and they were recommending it with when you have the near infrared on, but not recommending it when they only had the red on. And I was just like, what, what is their thinking behind this to not, you don't need the eye protection if only the red is on. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, they're and just knowing like, no, like anything with their recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and it's a lot to, to kind of think about of making it so complex. Oh, sometimes you wear goggles. Sometimes you don't like, that's kind of like inconsistent. Yeah. And we're going to get into the, a lot of the misconceptions and yeah. just flat out lies from most of the red light therapy companies out there. Um, but before we get into that, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the three primary mechanisms of action that make red light therapy so effective are one, that it's upregulating mitochondrial function, it's improving blood flow and circulation, and it's also positively impacting circadian rhythm. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd say those those are kind of like the the high level mechanisms of like what you feel and what what you get sometimes you get a reduction of inflammation so that's a huge one it kind of has this um, net effect of having kind of an antioxidant effect um, so it's great for reducing inflammation if you have pain um, you know it, it'll reduce pain very well um, sometimes you need to do kind of multiple doses over a period of time to get that pain reduction but it does work so um, and like I said just some of the immediate stuff of like um, cell proliferation is is a big one of signaling the the you know genes in our in our cells our nucleus to promote cell proliferation and that can be great for wound healing that can be great for um, building new collagen in the skin that helps you know reduce scars and reduce wrinkles and things like that so um, you know the cell proliferation is also a huge one yeah what I was gonna say is like ROS is a big part of that yeah. I sent you guys that message of, you know, me just asking chat GBD questions, but you know, the stimulating cytochrome C oxidase increases, you know, the DP, but it uh, consumes more oxygen, increases ROS. And this idea ROS stimulates NFKB and NRF2. NFKB ha is a protein complex that acts as a transcription, um, in the on the dna and this activation causes trans um let's see i wrote it down it's involved like what it's causing you know it's affecting the dna and then it's creating um things that involve in the immune system inflammation antioxidant defense cellular repair um nrf2 is an expression enzyme that um, creates superoxide, dismutase, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase, which helps with the oxidative stress of the ROS and helps with detox and other things. But I think the ROS is a big effect, but if you overdo it and you get too much ROS, then you can start having oxidative stress and that impairs mitochondrial function um, and ATP production. So there's kind of this like, that's where you get into maybe the biophasic dose response or just like not overdoing red light. There's just a, there's a right amount that there seems to, like you just need to get the right amount to have this effect. Mm -hmm. And that signaling the ROS is a signaling molecule. NO is a signaling molecule and it has really complex effects on the body. The other thing is um, stimulating stem cells that can have effects on increasing blood flow to places too and creating new blood vessels and stuff so it red light is just stupid complex on how it's working and even the researchers so sometimes they will admit that they don't know how a lot of these effects are happening especially the systemic benefits um because you know you have remote effects on the body and pinpointing what's actually happening is hard to do so for all of the normal folks out there i'm, I'm going to do my best to break down 
Phil's talk into something that, that we can understand. So ROS is reactive oxygen species. Uh, NO is nitric oxide, which we already covered. So yeah, Phil just sent me a message before this talking about how red light works essentially. And in the beginning, when you just start using it, it increases reactive oxygen species, which is not typically a good thing, but over time, so it, it increases reactive oxygen species, which then essentially makes the mitochondria work harder and consume more oxygen, which again is not a, a good thing in the... Well, in I, I would view it like a stress response from working out in a way. You know, mm -hmm. this uh, a response and then your body responds to it and you get benefits from that. So like what I said was... It's like a hormetic body stress. stimulating the yep. mitochondria with red light increases ROS and oxygen consumption. And then also red light lowers ROS and oxygen consumption as like a long-term effect, uh, which is like a, it's kind of a complex thing to say, but like there's a, they'll look at, they'll use functional near infrared spectrometry and they'll look at the brain and they can measure like, the oxygen usage and after a red light treatment um they can measure the oxygen usage that's it fluctuates instantly with how the brain's you know your thought creates neurons firing which require a lot of oxygen but after the red light treatment or the near infrared treatment that oxygen consumption was lowered so the brain activity from this specific measurement was down it showed that to do this specific task required less oxygen which I thought's fascinating because that's showing that the mitochondria are more efficient in using less oxygen, even though you're putting in probably better blood flow to certain areas of the brain to use oxygen, but they're requiring less oxygen to do the same task. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's, so that's complex, but yeah, no, it, it makes sense. So it's like this paradox that initially it increases reactive oxygen species, increases oxygen consumption, but then because of the hormetic stress effect because your yeah. mitochondria are being challenged in that way then they get more efficient at producing energy at consuming oxygen so then you actually use less oxygen and decrease reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress correct and that could be part of some of the neuroprotective effects that you see in some of these red light studies i would mm -hmm. think is less yeah. ros on the brain and yeah so to to kind of summarize the benefits here and we'll continue going into some of the benefits, but basically anything that increases mitochondrial function, increases blood flow, that's going to affect basically every single thing in your life. So red light therapy, good for brain health, like anxiety, depression, a lot of things that we already covered, headaches, migraines, sleep, skin health, Injury recovery, muscle recovery, blood flow, wound healing. Uh, yeah. So if you, many apply, things. if you apply that to like, if you look at the studies or like a disease that would be referred to as hypoxia, you know, a lack of oxygen to the mitochondria, which causes mitochondrial dysfunction from a lack of oxygen. It's a common thing seen in the retina, parts of the brain from traumatic brain injury. You know, it's yeah, I'll stop there. So before we get into the misconceptions about red light and how most of these companies are just flat out lying to us. I want to differentiate between red light therapy and red light, like red light bulbs, for example. So all the, well, most of the benefits that we're talking about, aside from the circadian rhythm benefits are primarily coming from red light therapy, which is, you know, these panels that, um, Andrew creates from Gembred, but you also create red light bulbs. So you, Andrew, you want to talk to us a little bit about the difference between red light therapy panels and red light bulbs and the difference in benefits of those. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always a big question of like, oh, why can't I get some red Christmas lights or get, yeah. you know, just kind of a generic red party bulb? Is that red light therapy? And the answer is no, because when, you know, you kind of want the right spectrum, you want some specific wavelengths that are shown to be, you know, biologically active. So you don't know what wavelengths a, a generic red light bulb, bulb will have. But more importantly is you're not getting the right intensity. So usually 
you know, the therapy lamps are going to be more focused. Uh, a lot of times they'll use lenses or, you know, reflectors to shine the light straight forward towards you. And you're really trying to get a direct cellular impact. So you're always aiming the therapy lamp directly at the skin. You're, you know, directly aiming it at wherever you're trying to treat, as opposed to, you know, just an ambient red light bulb. That's just, you know, a light bulb that sits on your ceiling or sits in a lamp. And that's just giving you ambient lighting. And so the important part of that is that, you know, the, our ambient lighting, especially at night, is very bad for us if we're using standard LEDs or fluorescents because they have a strong peak of blue. And that blue is what kind of uh, it stimulates wakefulness. It shuts down melatonin production. We have this kind of response curve to, to specifically kind of the blue lights and some of the green that causes us to shut down melatonin production at night. And that's why we get poorer quality sleep and less melatonin from our sleep and, you know, delayed, um, you know, sleep response. So if you can replace, you know, some of your light bulb, your nighttime lights, put some, uh, you know, blue blocking filters on your screens and, and you know, TVs and whatnot, um, then you've reduced the blue light and you're just getting more of the red light that you can use to walk around, read your books at night and do what you got to do. And it's not disrupting your circadian rhythm. And so, you know, you want lower brightness, lower intensity, red light bulbs at night. And, you know, if that's too harsh for you, you can start with uh, orange or amber or yellow bulbs, um, but really get that blue light component, you know, taken down by a big notch. And so that's what I found. A lot of my early customers were using my panels as like night lights and ambient lights. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I should design some just standard, you know, cheaper red light bulbs um, so that's what I have. I have some red light bulbs. I've got night lights that you can clip onto your books. I've got a desk lamp that's red light. So they're not necessarily therapeutic in terms of photobiomodulation, but they're therapeutic in terms of supporting your sleep and your circadian rhythm, which, uh, like we said, you know, supporting your sleep is huge. So, you know, if that's all you, you can get to get started is reducing the blue light and get some red light bulbs at night, you know, you're, that's going to make a huge impact. And so that's how I started with a lot of this light therapy stuff is just, you know, wearing blue blockers and reducing, you know, the blue light at night, improving my sleep, getting, you know, sunlight and bright lights in the mornings and getting that circadian rhythm. And that's how you really get into realizing how much of an impact light has on you. Um, you know, and we talk about red light therapy, but that's really kind of a gateway into appreciating appreciating that all the lights in your environment, you know, play a role in in your health and and how your your body's reacting. Yeah. So yeah, I guess my house is a good display of all his products for ambient red light. You know, we have the captain's lifestyle immersion at our house, at my house. We got the big red spotlights in the backyard, which don't interrupt. Like you have a campfire. People often have spotlights on their backyard so they can see around and it just like disrupts the mood and your circadian rhythm. So like for that, scenario when we have that immersion just having spotlights around the house for people to get around and then i'll i'll mention his corn cob red light is the best bulb on the market even though it's simple all the other red light bulbs on the market are 630 nanometer more orangish and that deep red of the 660 is harder to find in a bulb and it's bright too when you have a you know a deep red you need a brighter light um, so it's, it's incredibly bright. It's worth the $29 for sure. I have, I think 25 or 30 of those bulbs along with some of the other bulbs that you've recommended the TCP, but yeah, those bulbs are it, the big thing is putting them in places that are diffusing the light. Cause they're so bright or behind like a TV. I replaced my led strip lights in every situation with one of those bulbs, just because you can't find strip lights that are 660 or it's harder and to have a bulb that doesn't flicker too is huge. So I'll mention that too. Um, that being the most common, like important thing to fix is a bulb that doesn't flicker. So that might be the first switch for people is getting good bulbs and you have good blogs on your website of what bulbs to choose. Probably uh, waveform or Phillips are the most affordable and actually might be the best being high CRI, which means they're balanced with red light. So there's a better balance and not a big spike in blue light. But those will be the biggest shifts for people is just getting no non-flicker bulbs. And this obsession with incandescent bulbs, you debunk on your website pretty well of just like 
LEDs, everyone fear mongers LEDs as like these devices that em- emit EMF and are, I, to think, of, think of all the fear mongering that goes with LEDs that just aren't true when they're the lowest flicker where incandescent bulbs flicker at like six to 14%. Um, and I would rather have an LED that's a little bit more narrow spectrum that doesn't have the near infrared. It's not flickering personally. And for anybody who doesn't know Phil and uh, his property, the Waken Ranch, like you mentioned, I host my retreats there and every single light in his house is red light. I have one, I have one, uh, no, two, two in, in, uh, in the washing or the dryer. 17, 17 K waveform bulbs that are amber <laughs> just in that they can turn on and off in the bathroom, you know, it's just in case somebody needs to flip it on. I think that's the most people need is 17 K, but yeah, maybe it's yeah, just that- cause I've, I've been using red light in my house since like 2014 only. So yeah, those- I've gotten really used to it. Yeah, those ones in the bathroom that he's talking about, he has them on like switches so you can turn them on or off. So in the morning, yeah, great. Turn it on. You can see better. But then at night you can turn them off and then it's just red. And then the only other white lights that I'm aware of are in the drying machine and then on your water dispenser. And then that's yeah. it. So like even I close my eyes when I hit the water dispenser, you know, <laughs> I have <laughs> yeah. no way of, I've tried to cover or like just plug. I'm, I'm too afraid to break the device if I like disconnect the light. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's how important this is. So without making this a whole podcast on circadian rhythm, which we absolutely could because of how foundational it is to overall health and wellness, it regulates your hormones, your neurotransmitters, and basically every single biological function it's it's the lowest hanging fruit yeah that's why i and it's hard to argue with even though people try to online with me yeah so I'm like so oh, did he drop shit we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll keep continue going. till he gets on yeah so that's how important it is like you, you go to phil's house you open the fridge red light because that's a problem like if you struggle with uh eating at night which by the way is a no go if you want to prioritize sleep. Eating as far away from bedtime is one of the best hacks you can do for sleep because digesting a meal elevates your core body temperature, which is the last thing that you want before On bed. That, and, and, and then it increases insulin or blood sugar. So th- there's a I'll, I'll shout out Regenerative Health Podcast, his newest episodes with Glenn Jeffrey, and he talks about the importance of like they they're the one they're measuring like re- they're doing red light studies on glucose. Um, like, so they'll have people consume a really sugary drink and then, um, before they'll expose them to red light and their sensitivity to that goes way down, meaning like their blood sugar spikes a lot less, but they'll also do studies of just shining blue light on small areas of the skin and measuring glucose levels and like their blood sugar goes up from just blue light. Mm -hmm. So that guy's real obsessed with adding near infrared to the environment and this idea that we're kind of lacking near infrared, um, and red light, which helps control all these strange, strange and complex mechanisms that control our metabolism, which tie into how we process like our blood glucose and shit. Yeah. So going back to the nighttime eating and, and opening up the fridge, not only are you spiking your blood sugar before bed, if, if you're having a meal and also elevating your core body temperature, but then if you open the fridge and you're just bombarded by that blue light that's elevating your cortisol it's destroying melatonin and it's increasing your blood sugar so which then makes you hungry exactly so like we've talked about prioritizing your circadian rhythm replacing your light bulbs getting some blue light blockers like these ones i have on right now from viva rays these are their daytime lenses that block the harmful peak in blue and then so what's cool about these is they're clip on so then i can just clip on the amber filters so this is around sunset and then they've got nighttime lenses that just completely block out all blue all green and reduce the intensity of the light by like 25 percent. you can also do the red hack on your phone so you can change your phone screen red you can install softwares on your computer to uh to make the the screen red phil creates these filters that go on your computers and tvs So he makes amber filters so you can still see a little bit of color. So you're able to watch a movie and not be completely discombobulated. 
So all of those are like we've talked about the lowest hanging fruit. Like these are the basics. Like well, and it's just so easy to do. I mean, it's harder to get somebody to work out or like yeah, it's just my kind of goes with the less is more red light protocol or like my my company or my blog before in 2014 I started was the less is more. And it was this idea of like doing all these things that are easy instead of like this idea everyone's like working out super hard and uh dieting super crazy when you could do these easy things first you know it takes no effort to have red light in my house really i mean Mm -hmm. and And it's calming and i'll include links to all these things like the light bulbs the blue light blockers the softwares red phone hack fills screens all of it will be in the description of this podcast you guys can make these super simple and incredibly valuable health hacks yeah, so. and Gemberide sells good light bulbs, and he sells those spotlights like the uh, the Beam and the Beam LX, which are like what I have on my house to get um, large amounts of red light. Or you can just use your red light panel that you buy from Gemberide too. Uh, I mean, it, and you can travel with it. You use that off, and you just shine it up towards the ceiling when you're not using it as a panel on your skin to yeah. use as ambient light. Yeah, I travel. So it has with- multiple functions. I, I travel with my improve or the uh, the vector and I just got today the the new spacer 2.2 so I'll travel with these panels and use them as lights you know if I go to a hotel or a friend's place and oftentimes I'll travel with red light bulbs as well and there's been many Airbnbs and friends places I've stayed at where I've just I've left the red lights there because they are super cheap Um and really, when it comes to your health, I, I want to get away from this, like focusing on the money. Like if, if you think, so that's one of the questions that we have for like red light therapy panels, uh, which we'll get to questions at the end. But people ask like, are there any cheaper options? Like it's so expensive. And I, one, Gemba Red is like the most affordable and highest quality. Plus with yeah. the discount code on top of that, it's just a, a no-brainer you, deal you, you see that reel i made this week of like all these small ass devices that are battery power that are going to break in like a year they're yeah. like you know up to 650 630 dollars the juve is 600 uh the lower like the cheaper companies are 300 and then you can get a vector which has three times the lights that you can use directly on the skin in so many different ways for $250 or $225 using either of our discount codes. It's just ridiculous. And it's so, it's so ridiculous how ahead Gemberit is. It's and not even a question. Like I was saying, I want to get away from focusing on the monetary cost of these one-time investments, but instead that focus a- on the value that you will get from them. And these devices will last probably 10 years when you say like, I mean, the life of a bulb and how often you use it, they, they, it'll last a long time more than you'll be, you'll be happy with it. Yeah. Super simple switches. I, I've recorded many podcasts on sleep where we talk about these things, but yeah, th- these are like red light bulbs, the, the phone hacks, the blue light blockers, and even red light therapy panels are really a no brainer if you care about optimizing your health, your wellness, and your overall productivity and and quality of life. So that's why I wanted to record this podcast with you guys today is to really convey the importance of red light. So the problem with this is that a lot of these bigger red light companies like Juve, for example, are giving out a lot of false advertising, a lot of false statements so now let's get into some of the misconceptions which andrea i want you to take on Uh, i want to hear your take on this because you do a fantastic job in your content on your blogs your youtube your instagram of showing these companies and like basically saying like hey these guys are lying to you like this is not accurate so what are some of the the misconceptions and lies in the red light industry that yeah, we need to be aware you know, of. I mean, yeah, we, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> like, I've dedicated a lot, of, several years of of uh, digging into this this stuff and trying to expose it and trying to be, you know, as as kind of factual as I can. Um, but you know, and and you know, being as respectful as I can. But 
at some point, like it's just getting pretty ridiculous that companies are still getting away with this stuff. Um, so, you know, you know, one of the first things kind of Juve came out with, and I saw them kind of get introduced at some of the original uh, bio, bulletproof biohacking conferences. And, you know, that's when I was starting to plant the bug in my head of like, something's like really off here with, with the marketing and how, how they were presenting it. And, you know, they didn't really know what they were saying. You know, they were, you know, they come out the gate, you know, a new product that says, oh, we're better than everyone else. Everyone before us is crap. They're low intensity. They don't work. And it's like, well, that doesn't make sense because there's already thousands of studies that existed before Juve existed. So, you know, that's kind of like a charlatan kind of tactic of like you come out with this new product and you say, oh, everything before this was crap. We're the only ones that do it right. And they, they kind of set the bar. They're very good at marketing and yep. really put this down the throats of everyone. They got all the big influencers on board and they were all parroting, you know, whatever they wanted them to say. And so that's kind of the pervasive, like a systemic nature of how marketing is happening in the biohacking community of like, they can say whatever they want and, you know, their their influencers will parrot it. And it just becomes, you know, the more you repeat a lie, the more it becomes like true, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the first things is that they claimed to be 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared at their their treatment distance. And so that's the intensity. You need the right intensity and you need, need the right exposure time to get the right therapeutic response. So we kind of talked about that a little bit, that you don't want too little exposure, you don't want too little intensity, you don't get any response, right? If you get the right amount, you get a stimulatory response, you get all those benefits that we're talking about. If you get too much intensity and all that stuff, uh, too much exposure time and dose, then you start to get an inhibitory response where the cells actually might actually perform slower, perform worse, you'll get slower benefits, or you might get no benefits. So you've just wasted your time with a lot of intensity, a lot of dosing, and then you don't get any benefits because you overdosed. Um, you know, again, there's barely any side effects when you overdose, but you just don't get any benefits. So they were very hardcore on this 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared number. And I think it came from them measuring with a solar power meter. It was very clear. All the uh, manufacturers on Alibaba, they were measuring their panels with solar power meters, um, you know, and, and then a lot of influencers started buying their own solar power meters and measuring it and be like, oh, look, the, look at this big number we're getting on this, this meter. And so I dug into it and found this meter measures falsely high because of the type of uh, sensor it uses, it's a silicone diode. It's used in laser power meters all the time, but it measures kind of um, on a spectrum. So it has higher sensitivity in the red and near infrared wavelengths. So if you're just measuring red and near infrared LED panels, it's going to double the real response. So it's, it's getting a falsely high kind of signal and it tells you it's 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And now companies are, are you know, getting much bigger numbers but they started at 100 and they said, OK, this is our number. So that was the big kind of layer of false advertising of just this, this intensity number that is one of the most important parameters to get red light therapy right, to get the right therapeutic response. You need that number you know, in, in the right range and you need to measure it properly. Otherwise, you can't dose it. If, if you buy a supplement or you get a drug that claims to be 100 milligrams, but they, they measured the weight wrong and it's only 40 milligrams, then you're going to have real problems with your drug and your dosing and all that stuff. So, and you don't know because it falsely claimed to be a hundred milligrams. I'll say something real quick and they yeah. do this, but they don't even say the distance usually of like what their radiance is, which I have now the most don't. problem with. So like if, if they were all using solar power meters, which a lot of the companies are kind of coming to terms that they are and you have, um, Block Blue Light just started recently putting spectrometer meter, um, light spectrometer readings. So they list both, but a company needs to list from, from every single way. distance. Yeah, they probably get it from China and they don't even measure it themselves, but they need to and list the different their, distances. So, you know, you're the only company listing from different distances. So, you know, like, yeah. oh, I'm six inches, 12 inches, 24 inches. Like if you're listing a radiance, you should list that. No other company does that. Yeah, I it, thought, yeah, that was always odd, you know, so so the intensity numbers. So then, so all the narratives were built up around this 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And that was kind of assumed that was like 
the bare minimum to get the effect. So if you read Witten's original book on, on the ultimate guide to red light therapy, he constructed his whole book and his whole narrative around these false measurements and saying, oh, you really need 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared to get the right penetration and, and you know get the right dosing and all this stuff. But it was based on a false measurement. So this entire book is kind of based on incorrect measurements that he kind of just made up just to fit what the companies he was selling were, were claiming, which was a false it, claim. So it's it, this is totally, it's yeah. well established in the science, like of how to, how these are measured, and none of the none of the studies use that high of intensity. So they, it's just like right. they've completely separated themselves from the the studies and the science, and then they claim that they're scientifically backed by studies that use lower intensities than what they're listing. It's just so it's, it's, it's clown shit. It's really crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. If you hear um, Dr. Hamlin said in a couple interviews that a high intensity or an ideal intensity is between 10 to 20 milliwatts per centimeter square, not a hundred. So they, uh, you know, they 10 X what the real intensity should be. It should be closer to 10 to 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And some studies say, you know, if you go beyond about 50, you start to get more heating. You start to get negative effects just from the intensity alone, causing too much ROS, causing too much heat. And, and that becomes problematic. So this 100 number is actually dangerous. If people were actually using that, we're starting to see, you know, in the past year or so, a lot of people starting to have complaints that they're overheating their skin. They're getting kind of like a sunburn type reaction that these panels are too warm and you get kind of an erthema, which is, you know, the redness of the skin. So it's kind of like a sunburn, but it usually fades within a day. Um, you know, so it's not as bad as a, a real sunburn, but it's still this inflammatory response that you're getting from too much intensity. Um, so all these narratives that were put around 100 milliwatts are, are kind of dangerous because they're still seeking these high numbers. So that's the other kind of misconception is that they set up this narrative that it's all about the highest intensity is the best, bigger intensities are better, bigger intensities shorten your, your exposure time and save you time for treatments. And, you know, in some ways that could be theoretically correct, but most studies say you need the right amount of intensity and the right amount of exposure time you can't cut corners on the exposure time. So that's a harder kind of fallacy that I've been fighting against now of like people still think higher intensities are better. And that's just not the case. Why would you assume that higher intensities are better? You can get a high powered laser and burn your skin off if you want, but that's not a therapeutic effect. Um, so that's that's the other big, big lie. And, you know, they kind of backed up all these lies by claiming they were, you know, clinical grade or they did have a, a period of time they were falsely claiming to be FDA approved when they were not FDA approved. They're they're only FDA registered. And so that they, pretty, they still push that problem. by the way they market it yeah. as FDA approved. I know. They still yeah, do they, that. They imply they strongly imply they're still medically mm -hmm. something or other. So. Um, but they're not, you know, I mean, I think there was only one clinical study that actually used their panels and it found no significant improvement. So they are clinically studied, but they didn't get a significant improvement on one study. So it's very weird that all these companies claim to be clinical grade when I, you know, I haven't seen any peer reviewed published articles, you know, with their stuff on, on that. So how can they say that? And then uh, again, that just implies to the consumer that all their parameters are you know, medically validated when they're not, they're not really following the science at all. Um, so that's the other thing. And then, uh, you know, kind of like how you set up was use wavelengths, you know, the 660 and 850, the red is the 660, the near infrared is 850. So that two wavelengths, that kind of combo wavelengths that they started out with, that kind of became the industry standard for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've had to kind of debunk the, all that that those are not necessarily the best wavelengths for red light therapy, uh, especially, you know, what happened was, you know, other companies start saw that Chu's mo model was very profitable. So they just kind of copied their wavelengths. So for a period of a couple of years, all the companies were selling 660 and 850. So the consumer had to assume that the, the science was settled, that these are the best wavelengths or whatever, but they're not, especially uh, I'm hard on 850 because a lot of the studies show that they prefer 810 
or 830, because those are a little bit closer to the, the um, kind of a, this valley of, of absorption of, and that gets us the best penetration for 810 to 830. When you get longer wavelengths, they get more water absorption, so you actually get less penetration. Um, so, and they just found those those wavelengths are better, kind of at stimulating some of the cytochrome C oxidase absorption me mechanisms. So, um, so the wavelengths I've had to debunk, and uh, you know, I put out a really good article on on debunking how 850 is definitely not the best wavelength according to the current science. Um, and I think, you know, that's helped kind of re, you know, kind of retool a lot of people's brains on like, oh, you know, we got to think outside the box. We have to be more open minded to different types of wavelengths and different studies. Um, so I think that's gotten through. Uh, and then the other thing is the uh, distance treatment, right? The lack of non-contact, the lack of contact when you're doing red light therapy treatments. Again, you know, it seemed like it started with Juve that they knew their panels were kind of high EMF or maybe they were getting complaints. So they told everyone, oh, just stand at least six inches away and you're outside of the, the EMF fields. You'll, you know, you'll, you won't have any EMF exposure um, because remember, they were trying to market to a lot of health, you know, people that were really hardcore on health. Um, so that kind of became another industry standard that didn't have any scientific backing of this arbitrary six inches away, uh, kind of like telling people to stand, you know, six feet away from each other and you'll avoid <laughs> catch, catching a, fa a fancy flu. You know, it's arbitrary. Well, why was it six feet? Why not five? Why not seven? Were there any studies? You know, same thing with this six inches away uh, distance from your panel. There's just, it's, you know, it works, it's fine. But, um, you know, that just had no scientific backing at all. And so, you know, one of the things I pointed out is without the skin contact, you get a lot of reflection losses, and a lot of people have, have finally accepted that because you can see it when you take a selfie with your red light therapy panel, a lot of the red light is reflecting off your skin. And the same thing happens into the invisible near infrared that even about 60% of the you know 810s, 850s, uh, even the 1050s and 1060s, they reflect off the skin up to 50 or 60% from Caucasian skin. Uh, and actually all skin types for the near infrared. So that's a huge loss of that intensity of that absorbed energy that we need for the therapeutic response. So, um, you know, Dr. Hamlin said in multiple interviews that he prefers just putting his panel right on his skin. Um, you know, he just lays right on it or, or puts it right on it. And, you know, it's kind of convenient how a lot of people ignored Dr. Hamblin saying, you know, the stuff like that, and, uh, and the Dr. Narrative. Hamlin's the most like published and well, yeah. like he's the best, he's the top researcher on red light therapy. Right. He's been doing yeah. it a long time. And he, yeah, it's, that one interview where he laughs at like, it's a, like, it pretty much is a joke that people are hanging red light panels on their door and using them. But that's more of the idea of like, nobody's using it directly on the skin. That's more of the joke. Like there is a use to using it at a distance, but Juve has completely created this obsession with using it at a distance. And your average, every influencer has no idea or even like thinks about the importance of using it directly on the skin and the physics of light and how you're absorbing. So they're using high intensity from a distance it's losing a lot of reflection. So if, if you gain, if you, you know, come to that realization, then you use a higher dose to make up for that reflection. And then without realizing that that higher dose is all being absorbed in the first like millimeter of skin. So you're over treating the surface of the skin. When you're treating directly on the skin, you're getting much deeper and the absorption of that light energy is going into a lot deeper tissue. So, that's the only time I think it makes sense to start pushing higher intensities. And that's the only argument that you could make for me to, to, to like to use a hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared. Um, for using at a distance, it seems like that uh, 20, 15 to 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared is kind of the sweet spot, maybe 30 milliwatts. And the research, you know, all the full body red light studies are like, what 15 to 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared and when any of the studies that used like 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared start to kind of lose any significant benefits is that right and yeah yeah well most yeah most of the studies for full body light therapy yeah are about uh 15 i think 30 15 to 30 
because the Nova Thor is the most studied one. And I think that's mm -hmm. 28 milliwatts is how they report it in the study. So that one has like five studies on it. So first of all, there's not a lot of studies on full body red light therapy. There's only about, I think, 11 or 12 that I've collected so far from PubMed. And, you know, I've, I keep uh, keep an eye on any new studies. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things also of like, oh, you need a giant panel, you need to cover your whole body and your whole skin. And it's like, well, no, there's only like 12 actual studies on full body red light therapy. Most of the benefits have been gotten with smaller devices with even imagine like a small laser device, you know, they're getting all these benefits. So a lot of people kind of got buy into of like, you know, over consuming, buying huge panels, making big walls of, of panels that you stand in front of when most of the studies get very good results with targeted light therapy with smaller devices. So you can get a lot of bang for your buck, you know, like we were talking about with price of, you know, using smaller devices, not I try, I try to downsell people all the time when they contact me, I'm like, Hey, maybe you should start out with a smaller device. I can teach you some of the targeted treatment areas for systemic effects and you can get a lot of benefits. So the bigger device is better kind of, that's also a big gimmick. Um, and, and again, with the skin contact, you know, you do get benefits with yeah. non-contact, but with skin contact, yeah. you also compress the skin. So it physically kind of reduces the thickness of the skin. So that's really important because light gets exponentially absorbed as it goes through the skin. So if you can compress the skin, even by a little bit, you've shifted your penetration curve deeper into the cells. Um, you know, and if you're really trying to treat, you know, deeper tissues, muscles and brains and, um, you know, bones, then you really need that extra bit of getting that skin compression. And the mm. other thing skin compression does is that it pushes the blood out of the way. It pushes a lot of the water out of the way that absorbs the light as well. And so it pushes all that out of the way, reduces the absorption for the tissues underneath because it's pushed all that out and it's improved the scattering. It reduces the scattering. Um, so less of the light gets deflected out to the sides, more if it goes straight in. Um, so those are, are some of the key reasons you want that skin contact with a little bit of compression, like I added to the spacer models of hitting those convex lenses that really push the skin just by a couple millimeters just to get that deeper penetration. And it makes a huge difference once you start trying that out. And really you gotta reduce your dose you know, you only need to do a couple minutes per area with that spacer model because it penetrates so deeply and really gets to those deeper tissues much better than, you know, trying to blast yourself with a non-contact panel. You get pe better penetration with lower intensity with skin contact and some compression than you do with high intensity and non-contact with distance. So it's very hard because, again, all this marketing and all these influencers have kind of parroted, oh, you need really high intensities. And first off, you don't. And second off, it doesn't help your penetration. So, you know, it's it's all these fallacies that have trickled down throughout the years and just kind of become this kind of lazy kind of uh, marketing gimmick that everyone agreed. They're all just going to keep saying the same lies over and over and copy each other's lies. And it's just profitable. Um, yeah. So I, I think you were um, starting out with kind of, just this fallacy I was posting about it the other day of just does higher prices of devices lead to better quality? Does it lead to better results? Mm. And, you know, people assume, oh, higher price means it's gone through the FDA rigor morale. And, and that's why, you know, it's a higher price because they did FDA studies or whatnot. Uh, but none of that is true, especially with these red light therapy devices. They're do just doing some paperwork to get them FDA registered which doesn't cost much and it's not required to do because they're general wellness devices and they're just registering them under a loophole as heat lamps, which is another big, big problem. So they're registering their red light therapy panels at, as heat lamps as kind of a loophole to get it on the FDA registry so they can pretend like they're legit, but they didn't have to do any clinical studies. They don't have to prove equivalency to other devices and that's the real FDA process. They didn't do any of that. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. But yeah, so the price doesn't always correlate to quality, to effectiveness. You know, I've been proving that for years of making simple, you know, really effective, you know, 
just focusing on the right wavelengths, the right intensity, uh, you know, the right delivery, no, you know, gimmicks. You don't need uh, to control your red light therapy panel with an app or with, uh, <laughs> you know, a remote control. Like what, you know, so all these additional little gimmicks is what they use to justify the higher price and make it seem like, you know, you're getting something special. But um, ultimately, yeah, I just focus on making products that are really simple, accurate, you know, measurements, accurate intensity, the right wavelengths, you know, use them on the skin. It's, you know, just convenient. You don't have to measure out any distances and whatnot. And, um, you know, that's, that's it. You don't have to feel like you need to buy very expensive products, big products, excessive intensities, you know, wavelengths that aren't verified. Um, just get something really simple that, that, you know, works, you know? Mm -hmm. So, well, it's, so Juve claims like on their website, their higher price is because they're medical grade, which I think is the funniest shit. Cause yeah. I, I, you've done good blogs on this of like true medical grade should be direct skin contact because that's the most studied thing for yeah. therapeutic effects that the, that's backed by research. And then you also need to know the intensity. So really, I would, I would argue you're the only one selling medical grade devices besides some of the really expensive things like BioLite or there, there's a few right. other companies, that, but not many, definitely not you. They're not medical grade. Yeah. I, I like prediction with the red light therapy industry is like eventually they'll get into direct skin contact, but they're going to complete screw up just something like red light panels are really simple. And that's the beautiful thing about Gemberet is keeping it so simple and getting the right things correct. When these other companies get into, if they do get into direct skin contact, I'm sure they're going to screw the minor details that are important. They're going to overcomplicate stupid shit like apps and the things that they've already done to like, they're, they're stuck on full body red light panels. It's hard to improve them at all. So they're stuck in this world of, making really dumb upgrades to their panels to try and differentiate themselves when it's just like pointless stuff. So that's what Gember has done a good job of doing, keeping things really simple, things that won't break and getting the right things correct. But if they get in direct skin contact, I'm sure they're going to be like still intensity is the most important thing. And people will be like mega dosing on red light. And that's where like, when you're mega dosing directly on the skin, there's, there's there's more there's finer detail and things you could screw up because you're getting into deeper tissue that has that is mitochondrial dense, and that's where you will get higher reactive oxygen species from over treating and stuff. So I just assume if they ever get into that, the red light industry will screw that up mega. Like, yeah, right. And you know there is something to be said about this non-contact panels. You know, they were originally pretty low intensity, you know, maybe the original juves and some of the original panels were between, you know, 30 to 50, mid 50s of intensity milliwatts per centimeter squared. They didn't cause much heat. You know, nobody was complaining about overheating their skin. And it's a very safe way to use it at a, at a distance. You use it for 10 to 20 minutes. People were getting benefits. Maybe it's more through systemic mechanisms and through uh, kind of a bright light therapy effect, but they are very effective. So I still use non-contact panels, you know, occasionally that's kind of my sunlight supplement. And then I use the skin contact like the vectors and spacers and improved panels right on my skin for more targeted issues. If I, you know, pulled a muscle, if I have an ache or pain, you know, um, anything I need a little bit deeper healing, if I want to stimulate, um, you know, I put it on my shin bones for the stem cell release and so that's a huge um benefit so you know you can use both therapeutically and so that's one of the things of informed consent of just understanding your pros and cons for non-contact works and it's a little bit more superficial and it works through kind of systemic mechanisms and skin contact is more that direct deeper penetrating treatment and so as long as people know that and they're conscious about that it's fine to use non-contact so i you know I don't want to sound too, you know, you got to do things my way or the highway, you know, because I'm all about, try, you know, trying different things, seeing what works for you. And, you know, these panels do work. You just need to appreciate that they're working kind of differently than uh, how they're marketed, you know. So, like, yeah, we, don't a, want, we don't want to shit on distance too much. Go. So, so like, 
the differences between direct on skin contact and using it at, at a distance, for example, like at a distance, you would get some of the skin health benefits, like for correcting wrinkles and healing scars and helping repair uh, yeah. sunburns, yeah. for example. Right. Okay. And then the, the direct on skin, you're getting that deeper penetration, which I mean, I'm all about the deeper penetration. So <laughs> it's hard. I, I write so many like posts about penetration. I'm like, I really wish it were for that I could use that wasn't pen writing penetration all the time. I'm probably going to get flagged by some government thing of writing penetration all the time and researching. Penetration. <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've gone over the lies about the intensity, about the distance, about the wavelengths. What about meth and flicker? What, what do we need to look out for? It's for kind that? of a non-issue now, except EMF is if you're not using it, at a if you're using it at a distance, EMF is not an issue. Right. And then Flickr is kind of not a thing unless you're buying Amazon panels, maybe. Yeah. Back, um, you know, in 2017, 2018, all, all the panels were pretty high EMF and, and pretty high uh, Flickr. And, you know, they just didn't know any better. You know, I had some issues with EMFs and had to work on my designs, too. So, you know, everyone goes through that growing pain. Um, but, you know, EMFs with LED panels and, and Flickr. You know, that's the one of the ways LEDs kind of get demonized in general. And some people still say, oh, you know, I'm trying to avoid all LEDs from my lifestyle. You know, they're, they have too much blue light, too much EMFs, too much flicker, you know, all, all these problems. But, you know, you can make good quality LEDs with low EMFs and low flickers. Most of that is in how you design um, the power drivers to make sure you convert AC to DC, so you're getting a direct current to your LEDs. That makes sure it's a very stable, no flicker kind of power source, so that way it doesn't flicker up and down. So flicker is basically when the light source is turn kind of turning on and off very rapidly. And so with electronic flicker, a lot of times that's faster than our human eye can even see. It's at like 100 hertz or 120 hertz. If you're in the USA, it's 120 hertz. And it, because it's twice our AC cycle. So it's flickering up and down, up and down. And our eyes can't really see it. We still perceive it as continuous, but it's still causing like a neurological problem. Like our, our brain kind of trying to cope with this. Sometimes it causes kind of a strobe like kind of effect with how, how things are working. So the flicker could be a problem, especially which, like he said, you know, just cheap generic stuff. But most of the, you know, Therapeutic brands have designed the flicker out of their pro their panels um, with EMFs, so you can use our panels with skin contact with confidence. Is because we also remove the power drivers from most of our panels, and we re remove the fans. The cooling fan is kind of this little magnetic field generator, and that's how the fan spins. But that generates a big EMF, so we remove the fans from a lot of our panels to make sure you can use them on the skin and not have to worry about the EMFs. So that is a big thing, especially if you want to use skin contact. Um, for most other panels, you have to be, you know, six inches away or so, and that minimizes the EMF exposure. Um, so, you know, EMFs is, is kind of a thing. Some people have a uh, hypersensitivity to it. It can, you know, increase anxiety or increase kind of um, some mood disorders or, you know, cause blood, blood sugar issues or, you know, other other kind of stress response issues but you know we so we've always tried to design our panels to be super low emf and now that we're doing a lot more skin contact stuff we've really cracked the code on making sure the device the panel itself is very low emf so you can use it right on the skin well so now let's talk about deep penetration so stem cells a lot of people are spending thousands of dollars to get stem cell therapy when you could get the spacer 2 or the 2.2 both have the convex lens correct yeah yep. yeah so you can use this directly on the shin bone for example or the forehead to stimulate stem cells correct right yeah because forehead the, or the shin yeah and the and the sternum so, yeah and I, and I would say like those areas, it's actually not that deep, you know, it'll be like uh, the bone marrow in your shin, that area is actually pretty exposed. 
and it's about one to two centimeters. So you, you don't necessarily need the spacer for that. You can do it with the vector or um, some of the others. The only panel, you know, that the, the improves not going to be a high enough intensity to do that. It's a more of a systemic panel that you're using more for surface or mid-level treatment. But I, I don't actually think it makes takes that much penetration to stimulate the stem cells. And when you're stimulating the stem cells, what you're doing is just um, changing their what's the word? Um, you're you're stimulating them to need they're living in kind of a dormant state and then you're activating them in a way that they need to go seek oxygen so it liberates them and then they tend to gravitate towards metabolically active places like the brain and the heart uh and they give off cytokines and growth hormones that have a whole host of things that they do i think it is different from stem cell therapy stem cell therapy will be different in the effects you might have more targeted with stem cell therapy than you would with stimulating them in your shin or your forehead because those are going to, but it is a more natural way of doing it. It is different though. Yeah. And like, like you said, there's benefits. They'll shine lights on the tibias of like rodents and they'll find benefits to the heart. So that's one of the kind of remote treatments of you're able to use red light therapy on the tibia and it can benefit, benefit the heart and the brain. Um, because it's stimulating the stem cells to help with regrowth and anti-inflammatory effects in, you know, throughout the body and in parts of the body that need additional healing. So a lot of the future kind of, of using red light therapy in terms of dosing is kind of capitalizing on some of these remote targets um, that use systemic effects that if you want to treat your brain, you can do it through the forehead, you can wear a helmet, you can do the base of the neck. But then you also want to treat your gut and treat your your chin bones for more of the systemic effects for remote treatment. So you're kind of doing a, a combination of therapies like V-Light. Uh, we talked about they have the intranasal unit while you wear the headset. And the intranasal unit is also irradiating, irradiating the blood through, you know, through your nose. You get a lot of blood throat through, you know, through your nose. And that helps with systemic effects. But basically with, you know, any light panel, you're getting some blood irradiation wherever you use it. Um, so again, that's part of the systemic effects of, of red light therapy. So that's kind of the future where they're starting to do more studies where they combine the direct treatments with the remote treatments. And with my protocol, or I, I just use the improve as the systemic panel to replace the nose light. Cause I think it's ridiculous to, you know, they yeah, recommend like every single day with a light in your nose and they're using pretty high intensity in the nose when you could spread out that intensity and use 220 bulbs that are in the, the improved to cover a large area. If you yeah. listen to some of these studies or like some of these people doing the studies talk about red light therapy, like with each other, they'll talk about like, all right, so you did this treatment on the stomach. You actually don't know if if you treated the back or anywhere on the body if you get this remote effect because the remote effect of photobiomodulation seems so profound where you can treat one area of the body and get healing in other areas, you know, like treating one area of the body and you get better repair on the opposite side of the body from the actual like wound on the animal. Um, there's just a lot of studies like that are that are similar and how they conducted that where you get remote benefits so like if somebody has a c-section scar you don't want to necessarily treat that scar or the the wound right away so i recommend treating remotely with uh the improve which or you can do full body red light too but i i just think the improve being directly on the skin low intensity really consistent you're getting better penetration than the full body red light, but you're getting a remote effect for the body. So I like to use it just the the systemic benefits is fascinating. I think that's one of the most fascinating things and like what's actually causing that. We don't really know. It could be the mitochondria in the blood. It could be um, the ROS. There's a lot of things it could be, could be the structuring of water. Uh, There could be an effect on the mitochondria that's remote and how they communicate and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I framed, I did a whole blog about the systemic effects of red light therapy and really tried to frame it of like, this is how you get the deepest penetration when you really learn about how these systemic effects work. Because if most of the red light um, only penetrates, you know, 10 to 20 millimeters 
through the skin, you know, that's not always very deep, you know, depending on which part of the body you're doing, especially, you know, you don't really get much at the lower la layers. Um, so you have to appreciate how do we dose it to get the systemic effects that, that reaches deeper in the body, sends those kind of signaling mechanisms and some of those mechanisms into the rest of the body. And that's how you really maximize, you know, your depth of effectiveness, even though your depth of your photons might not be very good. Yeah, that's why I think the, the beauty of the improve or your Rex or their groove is I think you need to be more strategic and you need to be more careful with treating the higher intensity panels that get deeper penetration. But appreciating the improve is just like a lower, lower intensity. You can treat multiple days in a row. You don't really need to worry how long to treat. You can give it to like your grandma and it's going to heat up and she's going to take it off when it's time to take it off. There's not really like, it'd be pretty hard to overdo that panel because you're not getting the pen the deeper penetration, which I think is a good thing to get yeah. those systemic benefits and being able to do longer treatments, like 20 to 30 minutes or 40 minutes a day sometimes. So you guys have mentioned blood irradiation a couple of times. What are the benefits of that? Yeah. I mean, it's basically ends up being kind of an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Some, well, I saw one study, they treated the wrists of, you know, again, the blood throw th through your wrist and they were treating low back pain. So it's like amazing how, you know, these benefits can transfer to other parts of the body. So, um, you know, it helps with kind of brain health. That's why they do some of the systemic blood irradiation for, you know, the V-light kind of stuff to help with getting the, the blood into the brain. It can help with, um, we have free floating mitochondria in the blood. And somehow that was only discovered a couple of years ago that we have tons and tons of cell free mitochondria just floating in our blood. And so that might be picking up some of the energy and improving the mitochondria that's in our bloodstream. And then that can get carried to other parts of the body. But even without knowing this mechanism, that's been a staple treatment method for, for red light therapy for, for decades of this blood treatments. It can be through the wrist. Sometimes they can insert, uh, you know, a needle with a fiber optic and get some of the light you know, into the, through the skin, into the blood directly. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's necessary. And, you know, you don't need an invasive treatment. Um, but yeah, I'm going to have like a little wrist product pretty soon. It's about the size of a watch that you wear out, wear on your underside of your wrist. You use it for 10 minutes and it gets that blood irradiation. And so again, that can kind of have some of your full body effects without needing to treat your whole body. So that's, that's the amazing thing. Bill, you're muted. Doesn't it seem like for blood irradiation, it seems like you need longer treatments. Some of these studies will do like pretty high doses when they do that. You know, like yeah, I the, saw the like somebody, room. they were doing their arm, they're trying to stay away from acupuncture points, but they were f measuring their brain waves and affecting their brain waves. And then they were cinching their arm to cut off blood circulation to sure. show that it was probably in the blood because it, yeah, if they did that and then they released it, then the delayed effects, then they would read it on the uh, probably EKG or I don't know what, I forget what thing they were reading, brain waves, but they were affecting the brain waves. They were showing like they were going off of a study that was using treatments on the hand and they were using pretty high dosages, but hmm. I would rather use lower intensity for long periods of time. It just seems like that's one of those things you want to use for low doses at long periods of time instead of... Um, affecting the tissue around it from doing over irradiation from doing too high a dose. Yeah. I think one of the Russian authors, he, he seems to prefer about 20 minutes for a blood irradiation kind of treatment. And I tried to connect that to like, Oh, that's an interesting coincidence that a lot of the full body red light therapy protocols are 20 minutes, like in the pods, you know, in the clinical studies, they do about, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. And because that full body is more of a systemic effect, you're getting a lot of blood radiation when you're doing a full body treatment. And it seems like full body treatments are more of a systemic treatment. And a lot of people are still trying to falsely measure, uh, dose them as a direct treatment. And for direct treatments, you know, a laser or, you know, an LED with the convex lenses, that's where you can do more, you know, shorter doses, you know, between a couple of minutes, you know, per area because you're getting that di direct deeper penetration. So it's kind of these differences of techniques with direct treatments with, you know, 
skin contact. It might be only a couple of minutes or, you know, with the spacer, I recommend just starting with one or two minutes per, per area. But with blood irradiation and with trying to activate a lot of the systemic mechanisms, you probably want closer to like 15 to 20 minutes of exposure time to get that systemic effect, you know, into the system. And that's where like the improve or a full body panel would be good. I think I bet I would guess your improve being on a small area would have the same level of systemic benefits as like going into a full body red light bed. Yeah. Yeah. Just because the uh, studies they did uh, one study on COVID patients that they just did like part of the torso and they only used like, I think it was 2.9 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Uh, I forget the time of, I think it was like 15 minutes, but again, people would be crying on, on social media and, you know, the influencers, but, oh, that's so low. You can't get any effect, but 2.9 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And they got a great effect for um, helping with COVID patients. And then the other study um, was on the blood glucose, like Glenn Jeffries has been doing Mm -hmm. as part of the back and you get a full body blood glucose kind of response into your circulation. So I feel like Glenn um, Jeffrey was really into treating the eyes for that too. Yeah. Like he was measuring people with glucose effect from just treating the eyes, which might be blood irradiation because so much blood and oxygen is used in the eye. Yep. Yep. So let's, let's stay on this for the eyes. Talk to us about treating the eyes. Like what? So lower intensity at a distance. What, what are the benefits? I had mentioned that regenerative health podcast with the Jen Gleffrey, Jeffrey guy, and it's not a study, but he was mentioning at the end of the podcast, kids with severe mitochondrial diseases to the point where they, you know, they can't open their eyes or like, like they're really like dysfunctional and really, you know, messed up. And they were only treating the eyes of these kids and who knows, they're not, they're not really going down to the, I I guess I'm going to guess they don't even know the intensities they were using and stuff. Where I think it's with Gemberid's panels, you only it's the only way to know the intensities really of like you're treating your eyes with this level of intensity. And I think that's important with such a delicate organ. And the eye seems like the retina is the gateway to your brain. It's the most it's mitochondrial dense. It's using more oxygen than any other organ in the body, which is kind of crazy to me. Uh, it's repairing uh, and regenerating cones and rods for your photoreceptive system. There's non-photoreceptors in there. Uh, There's the effect, there's a lot of ROS in there. You might be increasing melatonin um, at the mitochondrial level, which helps with um, some of that ROS. You are doing the the effects. I, I think it's important to treat the eyes early in the morning. I think that's pretty well studied that you need that bright light in the morning and that's where you'll get most of the effects from treating the eyes. So if somebody's going to do that and what some of the stuff, I, I would say around what I'm recommending is like 1.2 to two joules per centimeter squared, which with the improved, that's about five minutes from three to six inches away. The vectors, the other panel, and that would be, I like it from 24 inches away for about three to four minutes. Uh, you can, that's using it, aiming for about five to 10 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which is a pretty low intensity, pretty gentle on the eyes. But like, if you just take your Mito red, um, or your biomax 300, we don't really know the intensities from different distances. You might be getting, you might be blasting your eyes with, um, pretty high intensity. Some of the studies, what they used 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared, and it's still safe. So recommending five to 10 milliwatts per centimeters is extremely safe because it's, uh, 10 times lower intensities often than like some of these studies that they use that show that it's safe and what like maybe a hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared squared is where you could damage your eyes. But I just think you, it's definitely makes sense to stay lower, use lower doses being mitochondrial dense. You don't need as high a dose. Um, and I think you do get whole body effects. I think it's important to treating for brain conditions, TBI, uh, there's not a lot of studies on that, but like Dr. Hamlin's big on that. Um, your blogs, you always mention, you know, 670 is the studied light, but Dr. Hamlin thinks you should be using near infrared and red. I think it just makes sense to use all the frequencies, but use it low 
um, stick to low doses early in the morning. And if you stay to low doses around one to two, I don't see a problem with doing it every single day to wake up and stimulate your circadian rhythm and stuff. So that's what I'm kind of leaning towards every single day. Even if I go out and get sunrise, I'm like, hey, I'm going to do this for a year. Every single day, stay really low dose. Um, and I don't see a problem with that. Talk a little bit more about that, Phil, about how we can hack our circadian rhythm if it's winter or if you live in a place where there's you know not a lot of sun exposure. And this is also another question. And you already touched on a little bit, like you're still getting outside and then doing red light therapy. So it's not a complete replacement. Or I'll wake up before the sun, do the red light and then go out in the sun. And then that's that I don't want to use blue light artificially from like the mood lamps and stuff to wake up. So like in the winter, especially I'll wake up before the sunrise off in like one or two hours before. And I'll start with the red light on the eyes to kind of get, get awake and get going. And then to get, before I get the, I'll get the blue light naturally from sunlight. Cause I just don't want to mess with that. I don't think that's smart to mess with artificial blue light for that, but that's just me. Um, flux. I mean, you've had blogs on that. I think flux, the brightness of the light can be um, beneficial. And that's an argument for maybe using the vector or the spacer. I actually find the spacer, I was leaning towards it not being good for the eyes, but like from your spacer 2.2 from let's see from yeah, six inches they're... away is eight milliwatts per centimeter squared which is beautiful and yeah, for pretty, two and a half to low. three minutes is 1.4 mil so it's intense directly on the skin but that light gets dispersed because of that lens so it's yeah. really good for the eyes actually it's pretty good intensity and you get pretty good flux from the vector or the spacer a little bit higher than you would to improve um, which can help stimulate that wakefulness yeah yeah and i say you know with all my panels um generally you don't need any kind of eye protection for for eye safety again you might have a photosensitivity or hypersensitivity to light and that's it's fine if you need you know welding goggles or um, some dark goggles or something but generally it's it's not required for my lights and uh like phil said if you use them at the right distance every one of my panels you can use for the eye health benefits and you can use for that kind of bright light therapy, especially if you're using it in the morning, you know, you, you have it at the right distance away. And, you know, with my products it might be a little confusing because all my products have kind of different intensity profiles depending on the model. So, um, you know, just look at the specs and look at, you know, make sure you want a low intensity, ideally maybe under about 10 milliwatts per centimeter squared, um, but it's fine to go up to like 20 or 30. You know, remember sunlight has a big proportion of red and near infrared. And, you know, we don't worry about red and near infrared from sunlight. Um, so, again, we don't have to worry about it from LEDs. You do have to worry about it with lasers because that light is coming in kind of at a very straight, um, you know, collimated beam of, of, you know, barely any beam angle. So it gets concentrated by our lens and then, you know, burns onto the retina. So that's why lasers are, are dangerous is part of that is the high intensity, but also the kind of beam angle of, of the laser coming straight into the eyes. With LEDs, you usually at least have some sort of beam angle, 30 degrees or 60 or 90 degrees. Um, so it makes it a lot more safer because the light is being diffused as it arrives at your eyes. So it's less likely to get focused onto your retina. So, you know, there's some myths of near infrared causing like cataracts, but that's really, you know, an olden time thing of, you know, people working at glass blower factories and foundries and not wearing the right safety goggles. And then, you know, you're exposed to that for 10 or 15 years and it's the high temperatures. There's also a lot of other wavelengths in, in those environments that are bad for you. And that's you where know, Jews you, recommendations are coming from. They're like, right. they still, so they, I, they, think, I think it's a carryover from some of those old standards. Um, but, you know, generally it's beneficial for your eyes. It's just that, that, association of infrared and cataracts was due to just very poor work conditions in some of those old foundries so um yeah so you generally shouldn't worry about it but again if your manufacturer tells you to wear goggles you know you should wear goggles unless they really can give you the right information the right intensities um you know making sure that the beam angles aren't 
too harsh for your eyes and things like that. So yeah, generally, you know, you should be able to use red light therapy. There's so many kind of multiple layers of effects that if you're training your eyes in the morning, you're benefiting your eyes, you're benefiting your circadian rhythms, you're getting some on your skin and helping your skincare. Um, you're setting up your day for cognitive support. You're setting up your day for, um, you know, physical support. So, you know, just getting that, you're always getting multiple benefits no matter how you use these things. And one of the things is just using it on the face and on the eyes gets like huge benefits for a lot of what people want out of red light therapy. So uh, that's why I think covering the eyes if you know, unless you really need to, covering your eyes kind of reduces a lot of those kind of systemic and and bright light therapy benefits and your eye health benefits. Yeah, and, and I'll say from personal experience, like today I'm running on zero hours of sleep. Oh. I was up all night editing uh, the latest episode of Living the Captain's Lifestyle, and uh, when when I get caught in those workflows, I just I go. It's like my most productive times and. I really have no problem pulling all nighters because my best work gets done and the next day I feel great. And so one of the things that I did was use the improve panel to treat my eyes cuz I'm just yeah. staring at a computer screen and I have uh, Iris installed which is one of the softwares that reduces the blue light so I I have that on and then also the the daytime blue light blockers but then still staring at the computer screen my eyes get tired, you know, start to feel those effects. And then after doing a few minutes with the improve, moving my eyes around, I felt so much better. Yeah. Uh, and of course, my other lifestyle habits lead into why I feel better than I imagine 95% of people do on a full eight hours of sleep. Like I went out and grounded, got morning sunlight, you know, doing all the things. Um, and I've got my red light on basically all day. So that this is another one of the problems is that we are blue light toxic and deficient in red and infrared light, correct? Because like we're in our homes when it's like, you know, the overhead lights are on and then you drive in your car with the windows up that blocks red and infrared and UV light. And then you're in an office building. So it's like we're being bombarded by this toxic blue light with the absence of the red and infrared. Right. So it's you're really little, putting yeah. his panels to the test. Oh yeah, and fun. also shout out to uh, Ketone IQ and Knickknacks for keeping me going. I was also fasting all day yesterday, so ketones keeping me going, keeping my brain sharp. And uh, same thing with Knickknacks. I'll I'll put in uh, discount codes for them. Uh, two great hacks, but not the topic of this podcast. So we're coming up on two hours and I want to make sure that we have time for some of the questions that I received from my community and social media. But before we get into that, I want to talk about acupuncture. So Phil, you mentioned some acupuncture points and in your light therapy protocol, you have a bunch of videos on specific acupuncture points and you target them with a super cheap, like $15 red flashlight. Can you Talk to us about yeah, like, and they I so I chose those specific flashlights because uh, Andrew has some nice YouTube posts where he measured the intensities of those with his expensive um, spectrometers. So it allows us to know a pretty good idea of the intensity of those and how to use them. Um, acupuncture, you know, it's a little bit woo. There's definitely something to increasing blood flow by treating some of the areas. I like to focus on like the primary acupuncture points. Uh, some of the acupuncture points, there might be inability to actually activate them because of how deep they are. And, you know, they're putting the needles like an inch or more in some of these areas. So the near infrared 810 flashlight might make more sense in those cases to get better penetration. Which is uh, the also... deepest penetrating wavelength, correct? Uh, yeah. 810. Would you say that in that area? 810, 830. Yeah. There's some new kind of hype around maybe 1050 or 1060, um, because it's a longer wavelength that has less scattering, but traditionally 810 is, yeah. is generally accepted as the best penetration. Yeah. So it's fine. I mean, it's pretty well studied and there are studies using, you know, on like acupuncture points for healing knees or, um, various things 
And yeah, I think it's just a kind of a fun thing to add on top of that. You can also just look at the maps of where all these acupuncture points are, and they tend to be good places to treat with panels, you know, on the lower back, around the head, you know, there might be effects, you know, in studies, they have to take into account that some of the effects they're getting might be from impacting some of these uh, acupuncture points. Uh, The head being one that has just so many acupuncture points on the head. But it's just fascinating to me that, you know, like for tennis elbow, I treat, um, what is it, large intestine four. I just think that's a good place to treat. And can I measure the effects or do I feel it? I don't know. if, If my kid's sick or if you have a headache, it, I think it helped with tennis elbow because if you watch acupuncturists, but um, I don't know what they're using to measure. Like I think it's just measuring, like showing the temperature of their skin change. They'll put the needle in and then you show the blood flow, kind of like go up their arm. It's like I think there's something really to it. It's kind of one of those things you got to try. If in I, I've always been into acupuncture from football. Uh, I use that as a therapy. I'd go to acupuncture, but it's so expensive and um. I like just being in control and the idea, like just, it's just kind of fun for me. It it gives you control. Yeah. There, I mean, there's studies you can look up on laser acupuncture. So they are Mm -hmm. studying it and, you know, trying to appreciate the difference between like a physical needle versus a light source, trying to activate the acupuncture points might have, you know, kind of different considerations for how they do it. Um, And that's, you know, some of the studies say, yeah, you can do, you know, laser acupuncture, you can target lymph nodes. Also, that's a huge area to get the lymph moving. Mm -hmm. Um, And that helps with the inflammation. And some people even say to kind of pre-treat the lymph nodes first, before you do your full body red light therapy or your other parts of your body. So make sure you've opened up those lymph nodes. If you are getting a detox reaction, some people kind of get that where things are kind of moving and they kind of feel a little bit of a Herx reaction from red light therapy. Usually it's very subtle, but um, it can happen for some people. So I think I told Phil to do one where it goes in under the armpits mm-hmm. when you raise your raise your arms up to the light panel and get it in, in the armpits for the circulation and the lymph nodes to get those going. Yeah, and, so that's uh, another big focus with flashlights. It's all, all the all the if you look at the lymph nodes, they're hard to treat areas with a panel. So it is nice to have uh, a little device. Uh, your newer device that you're coming out with will be good with that because you can really fit it in on the neck. You know, there's a lot yeah. up in the neck, uh, even just a factor. Um, you can kind of yeah. get kind of tricky to tr- treat the lymph nodes. Even the armpit's a little tricky to fit a panel under there, but it's pretty surface level. You might be able to treat it with a panel at a distance. It's yeah. pretty far. Like there's a lot in that area right? Uh, behind the, the knee. The groin and the knees, yeah. Even behind the knees, hard to treat with a panel, like to get it really good contact. Um, in the flashlight, you can really press. Uh, we do alter them a little bit by adding like epoxy to the top of it to get better penetration. And that was an idea that came from Andrew. And it works pretty well. So, yeah, um, I have a couple of reviews on um, cheap flashlights you can get from AliExpress, um, the Convoy S2 with 660, and then another one I, I forget ultra fire or what whatnot some generic brand yeah with the 810 nanometer flashlight so i've tested those out you know i don't want to sell flashlights i think it's pretty reductive you know you if you can get them on aliexpress for you know 15 to 30 bucks each and then just buy some batteries in the u.s to make sure they're good quality batteries um you can get a lot of bang for your buck just from some flashlights you know and use it on targeted areas like we're teaching you and you know it's amazing and then move up into bigger panels and and bigger coverage things and more sophisticated stuff but i always try to help people find some of the you know low-hanging fruit of of cheap stuff you can get started with and then you're always going to be like wow this is really working i'm going to go on to the next level of something bigger or you know from a a gamba red or whatnot so i think it always just helps get get the accessibility The funniest thing, I think uh, Gary and Sarah, I forget their last names, you know, they're, they're influencers in kind of this light space. They were really pushing, I think EMR tech for a while, but they started pushing these little flashlights that are $200. And I think they're blown away by the effects they're getting because they can finally use skin contact. They're like, holy shit, there's, this is better than a full body panel. Like a flashlight Mm -hmm. could be more powerful some for some things. 
you yeah. know, for treating a knee injury or your thyroid or something. That's, that's just some yeah, of the things they, the, pit, they pointed out. That's what the two study literally said was that they didn't get, they used the same dose as what they were using with skin contact devices and those work. And then they tried to use the same dose for the non-contact juve and they didn't get a good result. And maybe it's because of the lack of skin contact. So again, you know, it's it's amazing to appreciate just small devices, use them kind of strategically, and, and you get great results. So for anybody out there listening who's balling on a budget right now, pick up some of these low-hanging fruit biohacks like uh, the blue light blocking glasses, the pewter software, the Red light phone hack is free. Fifteen to thirty dollars for a flashlight that can target these acupuncture points. Boom. So it does not have to be expensive. That's the whole purpose of this conversation: is showing how simple and effective and cost effective that it it can be once you know what you're looking for. Make sure you get the the right ones. And again, I'll I'll link to everything that we're mentioning in the show notes. And um, I mentioned that you know the purpose of this podcast is to make things be simple. We're throwing out a lot of numbers and different panels and intensities and wavelengths and distances. This is one of the things I love about Phil, your red light protocols. You break down all of this like per panel, and you have these very useful charts that show you, okay, like if you're going for this specific benefit, use it at this distance for this amount of time and you break it down very, very simply. So that's that's one of the benefits of the uh, light therapy protocol. Again, a uh, link to that will be in the description. Uh, and you guys can use code CAPTAIN for a discount on the red light therapy protocol, which I'm a part of. The uh, private telegram chat is phenomenal. You basically get Phil as your personal health coach in addition to all of these different protocols and the helpful charts and all of that. So now let's get into some of these questions. I want these to be rapid fire questions because we've covered a lot of them, but just to to give some some bullet points, this will also be good for content to trim this and use as uh, as short form reels. So uh, first question from Captain Seven Steves. Andrew, this, this question is for you. Which model of Gemba Red Panel would you recommend to start out? Like somebody who's just getting started into red light therapy, what's what's the best panel? I'd say the the improved panel is is kind of the go to, you know, most popular, super easy. It's the one foot by one foot square. It's got five wavelengths, so it can kind of cover a wide range of of you know benefits and and mechanisms. And it's low intensity. You can't over overheat yourself. You can't overdose yourself. Um, you use it for 15 to 20 minutes on different areas. You can hold it right on the skin. It's lightweight, easy to move around, easy to travel. You can sit down with it. You can put it behind your back, hold it wherever you want. And, you know, it's kind of just simple, you know, kind of slam dunk product, you know. But again, we have you know, products that are bigger or smaller, you know, and you can kind of go from there of, of what you think works best for you. What would you say, Phil? Um, I always, I always recommend them prove, like he said, cause you don't have to, you can't, you don't have to overthink it. You can just, I tell people to just treat the largest surface areas on your body and you get whole body effects. Um, Steve's question though, was about the spacer or the vector, um, directly. I remember, and that's kind of a hard one. I, I like the vector. I kind of, I push people towards that just because it's my favorite one for treating the head. Um, I find it to be the most, um, what it, it has the most uses of what it can be used, but really all the three panels that I mostly use for my red light protocol, you can all do the eyes, the face, um, and the skin. The only thing that you're not getting from the spacer and the vector is the, uh, you know, the lower intensity, you know, I, I just like, it's hard to choose between them because I just think the the improved low intensity is so beneficial and in combination with a little bit higher intensity to get deeper penetration. So it just depends on the person. Uh, for athletics, I think it makes sense to have a little bit higher intensity to be able to do deeper treatments into hopefully getting the muscles and for injuries and stuff. Uh, but you might get systemic benefits that affect the muscles and whatnot from just using the improve. You get effects on the brain. 
Um, so it's hard. I think with the with the improve and the a vector, that's the price of a tiny little device from Juve. You know, six hundred dollars. You can. I would buy both. And then the Spacer is kind of a more complex panel. You know, it's a more advanced panel just because of the intensity. But the beauty of it is using it for lower, like it's a little bit higher intensity and you can use it for short periods of time and treat a pretty large area, like five to seven places in 10 to 15 minutes, um, be using it one and a half to two minutes, you know? So there is something that that's the panel I tend to use before I go play pickleball, uh, especially for short on time. Um, but yeah, it's just hard to choose. I don't know. Get them all. All right. Next question from Joanne Jeter, 2008. She asks, do you need to do it daily and how long does it last? Good, good questions. Um, you don't necessarily need to do it daily. Uh, it really depends, you know, what exactly you're trying to treat and, and what benefits you're trying to get out of it. But a lot of the clinical trials might only do two to three sessions per week and, you know, they get great results. So um, there's kind of these this um, cum cumulative dose response that the benefits kind of stay in your system for about. 24 hours to 48 uh, hours after a dose has ended. And so that's why you can kind of dose it every other day or, you, you know, just a couple times a week and you still get those benefits throughout, you know, the week and it kind of builds up over time. You know, any kind of healing mechanism requires, you know, a certain amount of time to let ourselves heal. So it's not like a quick fix. It's not an immediate thing, but it does take, you know, a couple of weeks or, or a couple of months, depending on what you're trying to treat to really start to see those long term benefits. Um, but yeah, really, you know, depending on the severity of your issue, usually if it's more like a, a really severe issue that's not very responsive, um, then you might want to dose it more often. You might want to do it every other day and see if that works better. But a lot of times, yeah, just doing it, you know, I'd say anywhere from uh, three to five times a week is a good range to get started. And again, this is why I like Phil's red light protocol, because he, he just breaks it down like for what benefit you're looking for. This is how many times you do it per week for how many minutes at the correct distance and intensity. So it just makes it super simple. All right. Next question from Nicholas Wolfsight. He asks, what are the pros of doing red light compared to being in natural sunlight? Phil, you want to take that? Um. I mean, I, de I definitely think you should do both. Uh, it's nice to have a panel when you, a lot of people work in an office and get no sun, especially in the winter. Yeah. And I think I, I like the improve in that case because you can just like, I'm sitting at a chair, I can put it on my body. There might be some remote effects um, that help negate some of the effects of being inside or being in artificial light environment that you get from just having light on a small area of the body. Uh but the difference, you know, there is deeper penetration from using some of these panels directly on the skin than you would from the light on the sun. Um, so I, I think there are, yeah, but full body red light. And if you're getting a lot of sunlight, like I said, you know, it's kind of the same thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, I still, you know, it's hard to kind of compare because there's a good chunk of red and near infrared light from sunlight. And, you know, maybe if you do have perfect health and kind of an optimal lifestyle and, you you know, you're getting enough sunlight every day and you don't have winters and, you know, whatnot, then, you know, maybe you don't necessarily need red light therapy at, at a particular point in your life. But uh, for me, there's always going to be some sort of um, kind of, I keep it as like a first aid, your kind of first aid toolkit of any time you have an ache or a pain or a deeper kind of issue to use the red light therapy and get that therapeutic response and getting that sunlight is more of like that supplement for your optimal wellness. And, you know, there's always going to be a time between, you know, sunlight and red light therapy. And that's where with the skin contact, at least you're getting that deeper penetration and really treating, you know, the cells that need it the most where sunlight, you obviously can't use it on the skin. It's more of that kind of holistic benefit. Next question from Nookie 84. She asks, when is red light better, morning or evening? Usually it's, it's the studies usually point to the morning because mm -hmm. it seems like there's kind of a wave of our natural ATP production is rising in the morning. And it seems like the red light therapy used in the morning kind of helps amplify that, that rise of ATP production. 
So maybe if we're doing it in the evening and our ATP is winding down and you try to do red light therapy at that point, it's already kind of on the downslope. So that's where, you know, and again, some of the studies, they did it with humans for the eye health studies that they got better responses of treating the eyes in the morning than they did in the afternoon. So that's kind of the key thing for the eye health studies. Um, and then there's a couple studies with like flies and, and bees or whatnot that they get a better ATP response when they treat them in the mornings than in the, the evening. So, you know, so we don't have a lot of studies to, to kind of support this, but it seems like in the mornings, and again, it's really helping with that uh, anchoring the circadian rhythms and getting that going. Um, sometimes I advise people to avoid using, you know, the red light therapy on your face at night and into the eyes, because even a bright red light could suppress melatonin production and um, kind of reduce your um, improve your alertness at night. So if you do bright red lights on your face and your eyes, your your brain can gets kind of stimulated and your eyes get stimulated. Um, so sometimes you want to at least avoid the face and the eyes at night. You you know I usually do the torso, the chest, or the gut if I, or my shins at night, but I never do my face. Um, so there are some benefits. You know usually doing it in the morning seems to be the best thing for your buck. Um, but again, I don't want that to d- deter anyone. Use red light therapy whenever you can fit it in. Um, you know, most of the studies don't take account for like what time of day they're doing it. I think that'd be an interesting free data point that all studies should be doing anyway. But, you know, we assume they're kind of doing doing their, their testing during daylight hours on work, normal work hours. So, you know, anytime you can fit it in, that's the best time. Try to get into a routine and don't let, you know, kind of optimal stuff stop you from doing something that's effective, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's definitely strategy on if you use it in the evening, where to treat and how. And you could maybe get some sleep effects or benefits. Um, I do treat a good, pl- I treat the back of my head and my stomach or my chest, my sternum before bed, or maybe some acupuncture points that have um, could help you relax or whatnot. But you, I definitely avoid the red light. I like the um, Vector 810 um, at night. And he, Gamber, uh, Andrew's releasing a new vector that'll have the 1050 in it, which will be cool too. And it'll be like, it'll be that near infrared 810 and 1050. That'll be good uh, more towards the evening if that's when you have time to do red light. But I, I do both. I kind of split my dosage morning and evening. Nice. All right. Unique Creations by M asks Red light has changed my life. I canceled my surgery. Can I use my panel on my head for migraines? And I don't know which panel she has. So, right. Um, you know, yeah, you got to be cautious with the brain. Um, you know, sometimes migraines do get triggered by bright lights and, and certain kind of stimulus and whatever. So, but, you know, I would try, I would personally try it and see if it works for you. Just start with a couple minutes, try to do it on the face or the forehead. And, you know, just monitor your results, give yourself a couple days and make sure there's no problems. Um, but yeah, it could, could help with the migraines. And I think generally it's worth experimenting with it, you know, checking with your doctor if you have a type of migraine that you don't want to exacerbate with giving it too much energy or circulation or stimulation. But, you know, generally it should be uh, something worth trying. And you might find the improve on the body would also without treating the head directly. Um, there's also that effect where you can get, you know, increased pain, um, especially in older people from using red light and increasing the blood flow to an area and kind of firing those neurons. There might be an effect to migraines too, where like if you increase blood flow, you might actually trigger a migraine, especially if you're new to red light. So it might be, even if you get a triggered migraine from it, it might be one of those things that, Oh, if I do this for, um, a week or two, then it might actually help. You know, there's just complexity to that. Right. Um, maybe uh, this is a common point for headaches for a flashlight right there. You could also try and treat that with a panel too. But a lot of a lot of treatments, a lot of acupuncture points in the wrist and the hand, and they're pretty superficial. Those points, so you can use red light, um, red flashlights too for those points, and they seem to have an effect on migraines and stuff. Nice. All right, last few questions. 
Unknown asks, why do people use blue light therapy for acne? What's the difference? Yeah, it has to do with um, blue light is good at kind of inhibiting, you know, cells and inhibiting functions of cells. So we talked about that photobiomodulation. We're trying to bring it back around, you know, after these couple hours of blue light is really good at that inhibitory response. So it ends up killing and inhibiting the bacteria that causes acne. And it also seems to inhibit some of the you know, oil productions and, you know, helps with the skin complexion. If you do it, you know, again, you want it a lower kind of intensity and kind of a lower dose. Um, because again, you don't want to damage your skin while trying to treat acne. So again, you know, if you get the right device, um, you know, I, I don't know which brands do it like Omni Lux or whatever, you want a low intensity blue light that should just be able to clear some of the acne and help you out with that. But yeah, it's more of a using that inhibitory response to kind of kill off the acne and kill off some of the mechanisms that cause cause the acne. Yeah, I, I personally find it kind of sketch, you know, if you apply the red light industry lying about intensities and not understanding what intensities to use, if you apply yeah. that to any of those devices, I just wouldn't trust it. And um, yeah, I, one thing you could do is methylene blue, right? I mean, kind of similar effects, methylene blue on the skin and like a tallow cream has, um, that ROS increase that kills bacteria and stuff. So that's something I would probably try before using blue yeah. light. You can, yeah, you can just use red light um, and it, it should help with acne. So you might not need blue light. So, yeah. you know, so try the red light first because it's safer and, and it can, can be effective for acne. Um, but if that doesn't work, then you might have to try the blue light as well. Cool. So that answers the next question from new to this 617. Does it help with scars from acne and injuries? And as we just yeah. heard, yes, it does. Yeah. Good for scars. Yep. Last question before I ask the question that I ask all my podcast guests. This one is from K Mason 277. Link to buy one will be in the description. You guys can use code Captain Morgan to pick up a Gemba Red light panel and also use code Captain for Phil's less is more red light protocol. All right. It's been a very informative two hours. Now for the, the question that I ask everybody. So we'll start with Phil. What does thriving mean to you? Um... Thriving to me is being happy and doing what you enjoy. Um, Simple. Yeah. Andrew, what does thriving mean to you? Yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, I would say, yeah, it's being able to do everything you want to do and and maybe then some of, you know, achieving your goals, having energy, being active, you know, having, you know, whatever fulfills you in terms of family and lifestyle and business and work and whatever and um just yeah living the way you want and and being active and being productive and uh you know at some point kind of making contribution to society or family or community and just being fulfilled in that way you're muted oh i'm muted there we go phil andrew anything else that we did not cover on this podcast that you feel is worth mentioning for red light um I would just say uh, thanks to Andrew. I mean, you called me a red light expert at the beginning of the podcast, and I don't really like that term of expert. I think the bar has been set so low in the red light industry, though. So I strangely probably would be an expert compared to all these people who think they know what they're talking about but don't. But all of my expertise kind of come uh, from an inspiration from Andrew and his blogs and things he's done. So I'd consider him a red light expert and then maybe Dr. Hamlin and a few others. But yeah, that's one thing I would say. So check out Andrew's blogs. They're very informative. Um, and you can learn pretty much anything if you have the time to go through those. Yeah. And I, I just add, um, you know, thanks for having us on and, and airing out all my grievances with the red light therapy industry. You know, I think we need more influencers like you that you know, stand up for what's right. You know, a lot of influencers have seemed to really sell out to brands that are false advertising intensity and, and you know, making up pseudoscience narratives to support incorrect measurements and just kind of really 
taking this industry down the wrong track. But if you really believe in benefits and the science of red light therapy, you still need a strong foundation of, you know, honest people, honest brands and, and companies and educated consumers that can really, you know, bring this to the next level. And if we keep just kind of squabbling over all these brands that are false advertising, you know, I feel like we can't really make a lot of progress. I feel like a lot of the content I'm doing is just trying to cover some basics and and trying to re-educate people on stuff that should have been known all along and that we can share our experiences that if we understand the right intensities and how we're dosing it, we can have that citizen science of the biohacking that was was supposed to be about. We can share our experiences, share our numbers. Like, like you said, a lot of these numbers are really foreign to people, but if people had a- accurate information six years ago, it, there'd be a lot con- less confusion right now. So again, you know, thanks for having us on and helping us kind of expose a lot of the problems with the industry. And that's, you know, a big step towards, you know, getting this industry back on track and helping all the people with really simple and affordable tools. Yes. Thank you guys for coming on, clear, clearing up the misconceptions for enlightening us literally on the effects of red light and how to use it properly. So with that, we'll close off this podcast, sending you all love and light. Remember, together we will make thriving standard. Peace and love, y'all. See you guys. See you. We hit two and a half.